Good morning. Welcome to Books at the Bottom of the Stairs. This is going to be a bit of a scrap heap of um, a video for you guys. I have a show and tell. I have been knitting this sweater for, I, it feels like three years, and uh, you're the only people who are going to see it because it's summer coming while it's spring, and so it's going to go up into the attic. So, ah. Anyways, I'm really pleased with it. That's got a really pink, pink, pink edge. But here's the best part. There's a ruffle. <laughs> so I can't figure out. Ah. There we go. You can see the ruffle. <laughs> it's not a knitting blog, but... That's messy. She's one of the slowest cats I've ever seen to get into her, you know, the final position. And uh, we're going to be sharing a couch, Missy and I, for this. And uh, she's like not happy that I'm going to be on the couch with her. It's hers, all six feet of it. Well, I'm talking to you from the couch in the living room where I am being oh so ill. I've got a head cold and uh, therefore things are just, you know, as they are, very little energy at the moment. But that doesn't mean I can't talk to about books, can always talk about books. I'm talking to you this week about a series written by William Ritter, and it is a four-part series. It's historical fiction as well as paranormal. Uh, the story takes place in the community of um, New... I just looked it up. New, Fi New Fiddleham? Honest to Pete, I just put it down and... Uh, New Fiddleham will go with for the next 30 seconds in America. And there is uh, Jack B is the main character. And there is Abigail, who has come across from um, England. She has quite an interesting backstory. And um, I'm redoing this intro because the first time it was such a muckle mess. I hope it's better this time. And I don't sneeze as much. But I hardly talked about Abigail at all, and she is the narrator of the book. And Abigail is a young lady who uh, comes from a fairly well-to-do family in England, whose dad was an archaeologist, and um, she spent her time at home learning as much about archaeology and the associated sciences as she could, reading her dad's library. Of course, mom wanted her to be doing the typical things. Um, I This book, this book takes place in the era of sort of 1890s to 1894 kind of little moment and um, so they haven't changed the technology at all it's not uh, it, it's not an imagined technology it's more an imagined um, world in terms of who and what kinds of beings inhabit the world so so we have a um, a fairly typical, almost New York kind of a feel to the city. Um, all, it's clearly not New York, but it has that kind of urbanization and, and uh, population and transportation and all those kinds of indicators of a fairly busy metropolis. And Abigail has run away from home um, off book and it has, um, has gone to an archaeological dig that was just not a success. And we read more about that in her backstory. And uh, she ends up crossing the ocean to America. And that's where she... Uh, she sort of stumbles upon Jacoby. I don't... It's it's a very, very weird introduction of, of from one... of one person to the other person. And she kind of blunders into his life um, and that's kind of the way they roll for the next four books is it's I think that impulse and and um, blundering solutions tend to be more the um, trend than sort of carefully calculated solutions to the problems that they encounter which makes for it's fun it, it makes it a little um, more what would you say uh, well, it adds it adds a lot of comic relief uh, on top of everything else. So, um, anyways, clip over to the next section. 
Yeah, whenever you get a jump like that, that just means I had to lie down on the floor and die for a few seconds. So, <laughs> okay, so Jacoby is this detective and we get his kind of crazy world. He inhabits a house that has a, a ghost that haunts it and um, his previous apprentice through some kind of conflagration of spells and mismatched winds and ended up turning into a duck. And so Jacoby has had the third floor attic turned into a pond for the duck. <laughs> oh, there's frogs and so It's just a great setting. The house is an amazing setting. And Jenny is the um, ghost of the house and she was murdered in it. And so there's a number of plot lines attached to Jenny and that she doesn't really remember what happened to her. And she asks Jacoby to solve the case. Um, she also can only stay within the house, um, but is working towards being able to leave the house and to be able to touch things and move things. So, so there's a large plot line attached to her. Jacoby has... Um, uh, several plot lines attached to him and he's what's called a seer s-e-e-r and um he can sense auras and magical trails and um he's sort of got it's not i forget what the name is where you see the world in colors but because he can also scent things and um kind of super hear things so he's got this like super attenuated attention to the world around him and so that makes him a very quirky kind of fellow in that he has to do certain things to kind of protect himself from information overload but also because his mind mind is also going a billion trillion miles an hour um sort of processing and deprocessing all the time he um He's extremely quirky and, and somewhat impatient um, and with other people. And then what happens in the first book, which is called Jack B, um, Jenny, um, Abigail, Abigail shows up and Abigail is a young girl on the run from England. She has crossed the Atlantic um, and is now in this new town that I've completely forgotten the name of new fiddleham or something like that and she through a series of kind of more tripping over herself than anything lands in Jacoby's um, home and becomes his next assistant and he doesn't really want an assistant she really wants to have a kind of job that's more interesting and is not like a governess or a tavern um, helper or something so they end up having the First book is more about the two of them kind of developing a relationship and mm, a sort of a tense employer-employee relationship. And there's all kinds of um, mm, non-normal things that are happening that Abigail has to come to terms with, recognizing that her employer is not totally caboobled in his head, that there really are things like trolls under the bridge. So it's a really delightful romp, and through it we basically encounter all the characters that we're going to meet in the next three books, as well as we meet the kind of, the mystery that we meet in the first book is actually just kind of a crack in what's ultimately going to happen by book four. And so each subsequent book opens that door a little bit more, and we start to see what um, is really going on because it's not just, you know, random, uh, random law breaking or random encounters with the other world. It uh, is a deeper, darker plot. So the second book is called Beastly Bones. And this is where um, a couple more characters come in. And this is the one where... Oh yes, shapeshifters come in and dinosaur bones are discovered and are the dinosaur bones being animated or are they even dinosaur bones? That's a good question. Um, Nellie shows up who is a female reporter who gets herself between um, an explosive and a dinosaur. Um, there's quite a, oh, what's his name now? Hunt, Hunts Hornby, I think. he's a He is a sort of 
big game hunter, he shows up and, because, uh, yeah, like, who wouldn't want to hunt a dinosaur, whether it's real or not, or just a skeleton, or if it's actually, you know, like, fully corporal, corporeal, cor cor corporeal, really alive. There's quite a dramatic ending. That book, I think, has more corpses than the others. Now, um, last week I commented in my series about uh, a lot of violence in the series, and um, I think fair enough that that uh, is something that needs to be discussed, just how much violence is too much and how much violence is not enough. Um, and we it triggered, actually, like some of the comments below triggered some interesting conversation amongst my other book reading friends about what is a climax, what is a tension line, how much violence does one need. Um, there is a separation between tension lines and violence, like they don't actually have to go hand in hand. We talked about all kinds of different books that um, don't have any kind of violence in them yet have very satisfying plot lines. So I, I think that's a really interesting subtopic that you know, people who are more versed in the world of um, a grander picture of all different kinds of books and genres and so on. I think that be make a really interesting booktube chat about um, just what are the component parts of good books and where do some of these things fall into play and where are they inappropriate. So I mean, not only violence, but also um, um gratuitous representation versus actual representation or you know there's so many conversations that are out there about what, what makes an interesting book so with respect to violence there's definitely um stuff happening here there are explosions there are um, um people dying but it's not in your face it generally happens off no there's an explosion that happens on page that's <laughs> pretty explosive so I will say that in, you know, in ranking it, if we were to sort of have uh, five bones or five skulls in terms of violence rankings, um, the previous one, I would say, was a four. This one, I'd say, sort of is a two, two bones, two and a half bones on the violence um, scale. Um, it can be quite creepy, which is different. Uh, and I think that people who really like ghost stories and monster stories and um it's not really gothic it's just it's it moves too quickly for gothic i think that might be one of the differences between gothic and other kinds of stories is that it, it builds gothic builds it takes its time it creates an atmosphere these characters and the dilemmas that they're encountering are very fast paced so the third book do to do is ghostly echoes now, you may, here, let me use two hands. The, the covers are very similar. They're all profiles of the characters. <clears throat> Did I say, yeah, profiles, profiles is right, yes. And so they're basically the same cover each time. That's number two, that's number three. And number four, we come back to Jack B's profile. And um, so, that's kind of fun. The covers are all being sort of the same and it just makes for a very nice little marketing package. Okay, now I just lost which ones. Book three, Ghostly Echoes. We have the story of Jenny Kavanaugh, the ghost, becoming more resolved. And there's um, a, she's what's called the cold case. And so they're also searching for Jenny's fiance. Uh, is he alive or dead? And there's a couple of other um, mythical underworld things that are happening that Abigail is solving and um, in so doing this is where the big bigger plot is starting to become more and more um, what's the word not evolved re revealed and we're encountering a bunch of scientists that have been murdered or are are missing and for some reason their wives also are being murdered and or missing and um, we're starting to see how the different levels of society are kind of rolling around in terms of this mystery like who's a pawn and who's an actor and who's being manipulated and who is intended it's 
it's sort of in a conspiracy theory in a way being unraveled because it, it, you get the people who don't believe in the underworld or the magical beings and then you get the people who do and so there's that kind of a tension at city hall level and I think I might be describing this book not very well I guess blame it on the cold but the series itself really chugs along quite nicely and the final one the dire king that's where you know it all gets pulled together and we discover that the fairies are involved and the veil between the worlds of, of magic and unmagic are being rent apart um like you know torn apart there is creatures on both sides of the world who really want to see that that dividing safeguard is obliterated and they're they're out for chaos and so our troop of all the heroes in the previous three books have come together and are um doing a sort of lord of the rings <laughs> battle to the battle to the end of of time kind of a fight it's the world will end if these people don't whoops sorry the world will end if these people don't hurl swords at each other and so on. So um, that really white, weird white line is my curtain. Sorry about that. Um, so it, it does have a little bit of the Lord of the Rings feeling about it in terms of, of how there's this slow reveal over several books. It has a bit more of um, a TV movie series like... Um, Oh my God, what's that one? Indiana Jones, you know, where each book, each book just really rollicks along and you don't, it's not until you're reading in the second book that you realize the connectivity between book two, back to back book one or back book three, back to book two. It's like, uh, they seem like standalones and they can be read as standalones, but there's definitely a, um, some very strong threads that travel through all four books. I read this as a as a binge again. Um, I really I really enjoy doing that. I don't know about you guys, but I detest waiting for uh, books. Like I even get impatient waiting for the books to come from the library, and I know they're all somewhere in the system. And it's like, oh, I'm waiting two days. Ah. So um, what I don't do though is that I don't put them all at hold at the same time because then they come in out of order. <laughs> And you're still waiting. So um, anyhow, I, I really enjoyed just binge reading this. I think each book took me about oh, like two and a half evenings of reading. And um, I yeah, I didn't I didn't plunge in. I did, didn't go in for a deep dive, but I certainly read them day after day until I was through the end. And I'm really, really happy. I felt that the ending of book four was such that there was potential for uh, it to continue on, but only in the sense that I loved the characters enough that I wanted to still spend time with them. I think in terms of the plot lines and so on, no, I think it's very well resolved and I hope um, that's not where Jack Ritter goes. I looked into uh, Goodreads and know that there, as far as I can tell, there aren't any um, upcoming books. And when was this last one? published um, 2017 so if he hasn't got book five on the way then you know that's I think that's a good sign and hopefully he's working on something else I do believe he's got something going in the um, the young middle readers I think that's where I actually encountered him was in middle readers so really interesting author William Ritter, really interesting series, the Jacoby series, and the titles again are Jacoby for book one, Beastly Bones for book two, Ghostly Echoes for book three, and The Dire King for book four. Well, I'll put that down in the information doodad um, at the end. I hope all your reading dreams and adventures continue to come true, that somewhere in your life is a happy sweater, and I'll see you next time. Bye-bye for now.